Good morning. Good morning. Apologies for the delay, and we'll get all of the presentations in line. We're going to move right along. I am Darrell Gunter. I will be your host and MC for this session of the Innovation Lightning Round number one. There's four other rounds, but you pick the right one. You're, you're in the room with, with the cool people. All right, let's see. So our agenda for today, we're going to introduce our speakers. Uh, each, each speaker will have 10 minutes. Uh, to speak, and then we're going to do a Q and A. Then we'll then we'll wrap up. <laughs> we have first uh, Aaron Gallagher and Rachel Elrod. I hope I said that correct from the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. Next will be Mr. Patrick Stanley of the University of Georgia, and then we have Mr. Uh, Simon Bell and Ms. Joe Creek. Is it Greg? Greg. Greg. Thank you. Uh, Bristol University Presses and Association of University Presses. And Amber Gagliardi, I hope I said that correct. Where's Amber? Hey, Amber, you're hiding. You're supposed to be up here. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, without further ado, uh, let me make sure I do this correctly. And I have the timer, so all over to you. Thank you, Darrell, and good morning, y'all. Thanks for joining us for these lightning rounds. Um, yes, I, it is Friday morning, and I do have conference voice, so thank you for bearing with me. I'm Erin Gallagher. I'm Chair of Acquisitions and Collection Services at the University of Florida at the George A. Smathers Libraries. I'm also co-investigator and assessment co-lead on the Institute of Museum and Library Services funded grant project entitled Middle Grade and Young Adult Books with Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, or BIPOC. Where are they? My co-presenter will <laughs> introduce herself in just a moment. All right, so what is the Diverse Book Finder? So it's a free online resource, and it presents a comprehensive collection of children's books featuring BIPOC characters. The collection includes all depictions of BIPOC characters in mainstream picture books published or distributed in the US since 2002. It includes the dominant themes within those books as well. It currently includes picture books, but we are working to expand to middle grade and young adult titles, and it's very exciting because we plan to go live with this in January 2024, so that's gonna be very soon. The collection is fully searchable, and we have collected, coded, and cataloged over 5,000 picture books depicting BIPOC characters, and the data that has resulted from this work is available to you. It is available to the public. And when I say data, I mean the data that examine and identify the disparities in representation of BIPOC in children's picture books. So this also includes a cat, and we're all li library people, so we love cats, but this isn't a cat cat, it's the collection analysis tool. Um, and this is specifically designed for library workers like you to audit the diversity of your picture book collections. So you just create a free account, you upload a file containing your ISBNs and titles, and then you receive a report of who is represented in your collection, and that would be racial and cultural groups, and how they are represented as far as dominant themes. It reveals the gaps and strengths of your collection, and particularly the racial and cultural representation within your collection. It can also help you target areas of collection growth, which is really important. It can help you advocate for more funding as well, and highlight how you are meeting or not meeting collection goals. So this whole project, including the metadata analysis and expansion, it started through a class at Bates College. And the students in this class were tasked with identifying themes from picture books. And so this is how these initial categories were developed. The expansion to middle grade and young adult titles has been developed largely based on recommendations from classes at California State University, Fresno, and at the University of Florida, and through the Diverse Book Finders metadata community of practice. So students in these classes and members of the community of practice have read children's books, and then they develop suggestions for metadata categories. It's a very iterative, it's a very nuanced process, um, and there will be additional and adjusted themes for the young adult and middle grade titles, as some themes are just not represented in picture books. And you can see exactly um, an example of some of the crosswalk here and how some of the themes in picture books like Any Child, Beautiful Life, uh, Race Culture Concepts are adapted for the themes present in older level books. 
So this work really does present a totally new way to categorize and think about major themes in books. The Library of Congress and other classification schemes just don't dig in at this level, and they don't dig into how characters are represented in stories. And this level of categorization is also not found in other collection search tools. And we really hope that the metadata work can be built on by other institutions and other organizations. Um, it also promises to help with enhanced discovery in online catalogs, which is a constant challenge and goal for all of us in libraries. So I'm gonna turn things over to Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel Elrod. I'm the director of the Education Library at the University of Florida. So, did you already talked about this? I mean, am I on the wrong slide? Okay, okay, I'm on the right slide. Um, so, I'll just talk a little bit more about the undergraduate courses. Our upper level undergraduate courses took place at um, Cal State Fresno and the University of Florida. And these classes um, looked at 150 books that had BIPOC characters as the you know, protagonist or strong secondary characters to compare how the storylines um, or the main themes of the stories compared to the ones in the picture books. Obviously, like um, Aaron mentioned, there is a lot of um, expansion going on there just because of the, there's a lot more going on in those older level readers. Um, and one of the things that was interesting is that with the picture books, largely they depended upon the pictures to tell the story of who is in the story what, as far as their race or ethnicity. Whereas in those middle grade and young adult books, one of the challenges became sometimes there was um, what appeared to be a BIPOC character on the cover of the story or the cover of the book, but you read the book and there was no mention of the race or culture of that character. And so like, do we include that or not? And I think we decided not to. Um, so a lot of times we found that the, the illustrators just took it upon themselves to create whatever they wanted to. Um, despite what might actually be in the text of the story. Um, how to go? This way? Yeah. And, and so we started off with this project hoping to do some kind of rating system. And we found that that was a little bit challenging. Um, in order to create some kind of rating, um, you would just have to have hundreds of people kind of on, on the, oh, what am I saying? Um, doing exactly the same thing. And it was just really challenging. So we decided upon this contributions to representation where the readers of the books would select one statement from each category that best applies to the book. So to the extent that we could find this information, um, what will be included in the new version of the Diverse Book Finder in January are the, uh, the author's lived experience, the illustrator's lived experience, and unique contributions. And so this is, you know, to the extent that we can find these, this information, whether the author has provided, author or illustrator has provided it on their website or the publisher has provided it, um, that will be included as well as whether or not the author or illustrator's lived experiences matches those of the protagonist of the stories. It's kind of the own voices kind of um, idea. Um, and what was I going to say? We're not planning on challenging the author or illustrator's self-identification. Um, oh, and then the unique contributions section. Sorry, I, I don't have exactly my notes that I was hoping to have up here. I'm, so I'm kind of winging it. Um, the unique contributions is um, books that will be tagged when the storyline is filling a gap that is um, not often seen in these stories. So an example would be um, a storyline with an African or African American character and um, a, a folk tale. Those are not often seen. So those would be tagged as a unique contribution to the literature. We also have what we're calling a reparative metadata project. Um, this is a working group where the members are rethinking the vocabularies to better reflect indige indigenous practices and centering indigenous views on this topics on these topics. The the work is meant to be iterative. It's not an endpoint. And the first stage is to review content tags and to identify what needs to be added to better describe indigenous peoples. Uh, the working group has 42 new content tags that are specific to indig indigenous lives, and can be applied to non-indigenous stories as well. An example that we have is that there is a category for diverse families, and one of the tags is customary adoption and indigenous kinship communities, uh, which will better represent unique family structures in these communities. Um, another example would be um, in the inequalities topic, there is a tag for generational trauma 
and cultural appropriation. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Aaron. Awesome. Oh, excuse me. This goes by so fast, y'all. All right, so I wanna thank you for joining us, but also I wanna leave you with a call to action. Publishers who ha might happen to be in the room, um, we hope that you consider including and marketing more titles with these themes as there is a definite evidence of need in the library and education community. And library workers, we encourage you to make use of the diverse book finder collection, the search tool, and the collection analysis tool. Also, you can contact Rachel or I. Our contact information is on our slides. And you can also contact the uh, diverse book finder team as well using the contact page there. So thanks a lot, y'all. Hey, my name is Patrick Stanley, and I am the Collections Logistics Librarian at the University of Georgia, which is a really fancy way of saying I play Tetris with all of our physical books. Um, also, thank you to Daryl for getting this set up, because it would have taken me much longer to find the correct PowerPoint uh, screen. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about an initiative that we did with our gifts book, gift books program called Box Camp. Uh, basically, we went out for about 10 weeks during the summer, half a day, once a week. Uh, students weren't around. It was in our off-site community. And being the nerdy librarians we were going through books, boxes of books, we called it a camp-like experience, hence Box Camp. The problem, uh, so this was our actual shelving no, it's from Raiders of the Lost Ark. But this is how I felt every day when I walked in. We had about 45,000 books, a backlog of 45,000 books. Um, we also, at the way that we were searching at that point, it would have taken us about 10 years to get through all of those books, which just was not sustainable. That doesn't account for any more gift books that we brought in. So we started looking at, you know, how could we fix this? For me, that began as a, how did we get here, right? So I started looking at the current incarnation of gifts that we had, um, and it started in the early 90s, and there's a few things that were present there. One, uh, we had a lot more space. Two, we had a lot fewer gift books, and we had a lot less information, right? We didn't have nearly as robust uh, avenues to find the information we might want. Uh, we also had different development standards, right? So. What it basically looked like was we figured out, did we have the book, uh, how many copies did we have, and what the circulation was. And if we didn't have it, we added it. And if we did have it, we probably still added it because you know, in the 90s, if you had one, why not have seven? Um, so this led into the 2000s. And there were some things changing in the 2000s that didn't really, you know, looking back, we can be like, why didn't anybody see this? Well, because when you're in the thick of it, you don't necessarily see these small incremental changes. We had a big increase in gifts. That was largely because a lot of faculty who had amassed really good collections were retiring or passing away, and we were ending up with those collections. Um, our space was filling, right? That's an obvious thing, but nobody really takes account on a day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis of how much space has actually filled. Uh, we also now had more data more internet, right? Uh, specifically, we were able to get a lot more information from other institutions, and we started bringing that in. And you know, most processes, you start with some information, you add a little, it gets more and more efficient, and then at a certain point, it gets, starts to get less efficient because we get too much information. And then we continue to get more information, and it just collapses the system in on itself. And that's kind of what happened. When we got to the point of doing this project, our process looked like searching the book. If we had it internally, we found basic information. If we didn't, we went to OCLC. And we were expected to find the exact printing of the book, how many other institutions worldwide held it, and if possible, what those circulation stats were, all to maybe inform if the selectors wanted to add it, because we didn't really know if the selectors were even using all that information. Then we'd put those books on a shelf, the selectors would come up to our office, they would look at it, and then they'd say, we want these, we don't want these, and so we'd package them up and send them off to their other places. Super inefficient. But that's kind of how it got built. So in order to split that up, I started thinking about it into two ways. First, we needed to separate out all those boxes that you saw in that previous slide that were totally ours. Uh, we needed to separate that stuff out as quickly as possible. And then we needed to make it so that as few as people, as, as few people as possible and as few steps as possible was involved in the searching. 
So the first thing is we had to figure out what information selectors were using. And asking them that was like, you know, well, it's, there's some science, but it's mostly an art. <laughs> and so through a lot of conversations, we teased out a few uh, objective things that were being used. Currency, circulation, subject, language, and aesthetics. And aesthetics here being, does the book need repair? Um, and then there were still, though, the subjective items that we wanted to kind of include, right? Uh, preferences and interest in subjects, um, potential future research value, and here aesthetics is, is the book pretty? Am I gonna look at it and see it on the shelf and wanna pull that off? Right, so these were some of the things that we were trying to include when we went through this process. I will leave the screen up for a minute. There's a tiny URL at the bottom which is gonna have all of the main documents that we used in this process. So if you wanna go there, you can see those. Um, but basically with the separating por portion, our goal was to quickly unbox and separate the books. And you can see we had some different always keep items, some always discard items. The one sheet on that tiny URL will have more diverse stuff and then has an explanatory one. But basically this was aimed at anybody, not even just the selectors, but anybody in the library could come with us, go through the books, use this one sheet, and basically very quickly pull stuff out that we were gonna search further for potential uh, usage. You know, we've all seen the 1975 sociology textbook that nobody in their right mind thinks we're going to add to the collection, and yet our old process still had us searching that. The new process could have us just putting it into a pile to go to our vendors. Okay. The second part was the searching, right? Instead of having all of those different searches in different, uh, you know, in OCLC and RILS and bringing in the selectors. We whittled it all down to a single workflow chart, which just required us to do one or two basic searches in Alma and could speed up that whole process. So once we kind of got all that, we had to test, right? Because then we had to convince all the selectors that we weren't going to be getting rid of the treasure that was in those boxes. So we split up three boxes and I salted those boxes because otherwise it would have been a lot less information that we could have used. And we had the selectors go through those. Um, it was three sets of 350-ish books, and they went through them with the old process. We went through that whole thing, then we brought in some folks who were not selectors at all, used the new process, and went through them in the same way. And basically, you can see old process would have added 413 of those books, new process would have added 416. There were five books that didn't overlap. In other words, one process added those and the other wouldn't have, or vice versa. And when we kind of presented that to the selectors, they all said, we're okay with those books getting added or not getting added. So statistically, it was essentially the same. So then it led us to box camp. Did 10 weeks of sorting, we got 45,000 books down to about 5,500 books. And then the searching, uh, we got down further to 2,500 books, a little over that. And so from the first time we opened a box and began searching to the last book being cataloged was 10 and a half months. So much faster than the 10 years. Um, now, where does this leave us with long-term benefits? Because this was really the thing, right? We did this in 2018. Um, we've had now five years, maybe a little bit less because pandemic wasn't real years, right? Um, they were simultaneously really long and also short for our jobs. But what we have is, number one, a lot less labor, right? We don't have the selectors coming up and doing that stuff. We're saving a lot of time in collection development. Cataloging isn't cataloging a lot of stuff that we don't really want anymore. Money. There's the interest, or the, there's the money saved in preservation and storage, but even better is we have a really thriving gifts program right now where we work with vendors and we are generating a pretty significant amount of money that comes right back into the library and we're doing that really fast. Um, and so, you know, the, the joke is, is that our gifts coordinator is actually the only person at our library who pays for her job. So she's got the most job security because she's actually bringing in money instead of just spending it. Um, Space, right now we are about to, or we are in the process of doing a major renovation on the fourth floor of our science library. We have to move 315,000 items off of there and 
we are out of space, right? We are trying to figure out space, but a big part of that is we now have this huge area where gifts were housed that can be used as a flex space. So we can temporarily put those things in. We temporarily put a whole bunch of leisure books that we are withdrawing in there and worked from that. We're creating an area that allows us as a library to move forward outside of that space as opposed to just kind of sitting there with boxes of gift books. And then the collection quality. Uh, when necessary, we can take a closer look now at the gifts that are coming in. So we don't necessarily have to just do, do we not have this book? We're adding it. You know, if we have a huge collection of very similar materials come in and we're not sure, because there are not, because there is not a huge backlog to go through, we have the uh, leisure to kind of look at those closer and on a one-on-one -on -one basis if we need to and improve the collection that way. And so that is our box camp. There is the tiny URL again if you didn't get it the first time around. And I appreciate you letting me share this with you. Right. Uh, hi, I'm Simon Bell. I'm the Institutional Sales Manager of Bristol University Press and its Implant Policy Press, which you may have seen quickly just before I announced myself there. And hi, y'all. I think that's the best way to start a presentation, although obviously Simon and I are from the UK, and I'm the Sales and Marketing Director at Bristol, and you get two for one from Bristol University Press, because we have the Imprint Policy Press, and I'm going to kick off quickly with a visualisation exercise, because this week I've been asked lots of times, where is Bristol? So I want you to imagine the UK and a map of the UK, and we are southwest. As you go round into Wales, that's where you'll find Bristol. And it's a very progressive and very beautiful city. And at Bristol University Press, we're also the same. We um, have a long history in addressing social issues, inequality, and discrimination. And it's been part of our DNA since we founded Policy Press in 1996. And that developed even further when we launched Bristol University Press six years ago um, in 2016. Um, seven years ago, in 2016. We have a long-standing reputation in publishing areas such as social and public policy, sociology, politics and international relations, um, and we have a really, truly global authorship from all corners of the world. It's quite incredible. In 2002, no, 2022 even, um, we launched Bristol University Press Digital. Um, as we said earlier, the pandemic years happened, and we, um, uh, the journey from concept to delivery was a struggle because we were all remote. But it was a truly collaborative relationship. We worked with librarians, we worked with the scholarly community to develop what we think is a really unique platform. So. The platform itself was developed with the aim to break down boundaries to participation in and access to uh, gl truly global social science research. Accessibility, inclusivity is very much at the bedrock of the new platform. And the result is a really engaged resource for interdisciplinary research, tackling global social challenges, and providing users with e-collections in the social sciences, uniquely curated and themed around global social si challenges and UN sustainable goals, development goals. Here's just a list of some of the benefits for users. Um, in addition to this, uh, it's, you've got a complete set of regularly updated marked records. It's all integrated with altmetrics. Um, it's DRM-free as well as unlimited users, um, multi-site access as well. And at most important of all, we have the amazing Heather Townsend, customer service and sales administrator in the office, who will be all too pleased to take any of you guys on a tour through the platform. We mentioned there the UN SDG Sustainable Development Goals. And as a uh, not-for-profit publisher with a really strong social mission, we were one of the first publishers to sign up to the, U the SDG Publisher Compact. There's lots of international publishers signed up, um, but we were one of the first. Um, because we are committed to publishing research that informs, develops, and supports those UN development goals. As a press, our global social challenges um, 
themes are informed by and linked to all of those SDGs. We don't just want this to be lip service, we want there to be an outcome, and all of our books and our journals um, are linked to the global social challenges. Um, we have, um, and it will inform our publishing up to 2013, <laughs> 2030. I don't know why I'm having a problem with dates today. It must be because it's been a long week. Um, and they cut across many disciplines and focus on social aspects of the challenges that we face. And you'll see those in the platform. Yeah. So we've brought together our journals and book content for the first time here. And the platform currently provides over 1,700 e-books and all of our 20 journals and our full open access portfolio. All the content, as we say, is tagged by the Global Social Challenges and the UN SDGs, and that provides an intuitive way for you guys to create content, curate content easily for teaching, for research, whether it's students, it's uh, research uh, faculty, teaching faculty, around all of these themes. But also what it provides you is resources to help you and to help your parent institution in informing and developing your own institutional um, SDG strategy. I say the platform itself is also home to uh, over 120 uh, open access monographs, and you've got access to over 400 open access journal articles. It also hosts our first fully open access journal, Global Social Challenges Journal. Um, which is gold open access at the moment, but we are in discussions to hopefully take this diamond open access by the end of the year. This was launched in 2022, and it's the first such publication to be based around social sciences while engaging with research from the humanities, arts, STEM. And our journal's mission is to address the urgent social issues while breaking down academic silos. Um, and we feel we've, we've, we've made a great start in the first 12 months. Uh, the first issue in 2022, 50% of the articles uh, came from authors based in the Global South. And the ethos and mission of the Global Social Challenges Journal project aligns well with our broader open access strategy and collaborative, in, in collaborative in initiatives to bring equality, inclusivity to the participation and the formulation and publishing of research, as well as the responsibility to the published end result and our other uh, outputs. We're incredibly proud of the platform, but of course it's a really rich resource. There's lots on it. And to make sure that you've got easy access, we've, curate, we've curated various different subject areas and various different collections. And actually, one of the reasons that we've come to Charleston, and there's three of us from Bristol here at Charleston, is it's because it's such a brilliant conference to get the industry information that we need to be able to change the way that we publish and inform the way that we publish. Last year when we came, and it was our first year, and not only have we changed the way that we've approached it this year to make sure that we can eat four times a day, um, is that we have, we listened to what you said. So last year the themes were very much about DEI. It was a very, very strong piece of the, the agenda that you were talking about. So we returned to Bristol and we created a free DEI con um, content collection that we then sent out to every delegate and we had lots of people take us up on that it was a free trial and you'll see that we've done the same thing again this year um, but you'll see there's lots and lots of our big library series on there we have really important um, research collections that we uh, publish through the pub through the platform as well as some really brilliant series like global migration and you can see them up there at the bottom but we have 12 subject areas in the social sciences and we have some really deep rich content that um i know and we already know that um students really respect and just following on from what joe said um after the dei collection we put together following discussions with you guys at charleston last year um we've put together um, a curated collection of our, of our sustainable development goals content across books and journals and please feel free to scan that QR code or we've got information on it later. Come and talk to us about it if you want to, to, to access access that, that content. Um, but most importantly, 
this is very much a kind of a developing platform. It's developing in terms of content, not just in the, the expansion of the content. And we want to hear from you guys as to what we can do to, to enhance it further, um, especially in terms of actual contextual ancillary content around the research to making sure that we're giving you a really good, as well as yourselves, but faculty members, students, a really good experience when, when, uh, when accessing our, our, our content from Bristol University Press. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Next up is Ambra. Ta -da. Hello everyone, um, I'm Amber Galliardi. I'm the collection development librarian at the University of Utah. And I'm here to present on my research project called Thematic Analysis of East Asia, Pan-Asia Collection Descriptions. Um, I'm gonna give you an overview of my research design and then I'm gonna jump into the themes which are the outputs of my research and I'm gonna do it all very quickly. <laughs> um, this is my research question. In a nutshell, I'm looking for themes and patterns in these area studies collection descriptions that are found in these federal grant proposals uh, to learn more about area studies collections in our country. Um, the rationale is that area studies collections require unique collecting methods and we can learn from each other and there is a wealth of data out there just waiting to be explored. Um, the methodology I'm using is called reflexive thematic analysis. Um, it's a method uh, cr created by social science researchers. Um, you can see the book here. Uh, Virginia Braun is from New Zealand. Uh, Victoria Clark is from England. Um, they publish heav heavily on this methodology, um, including this book, which acts as a guide. There's also YouTube videos, and so there was a lot of um, resources for me to tap into as I was learning this methodology. One unique thing about it is that it requires um, constant reflection uh, by the researcher of their subjectivity and the influence it has on the findings. Um, so you're constantly reflecting throughout. And like a quick overview of how the methodology works is you have your qualitative data set, um, you familiarize yourself with it by reading it over and over and over, and then you code the data. Um, you get really granular on it, um, and you, you code each um, line, and then you go back high level and you create themes from those codes and you refine those themes until you have a handful that really represent the data set as a whole. Um, then you report out. So my data set um, are uh, narratives from the Department of Education Title VI National Resource Center grants. So if you're from an academic institution, it's likely that your institution has received these for their area studies centers and programs. Um, what's unique about these grants is that you, in order to apply, you must be an academic institution, you must have employ scholars who are conducting research, and most importantly and relevant to my project is that uh, the institution must maintain specialized collections to support the area studies centers on campus. Um, so when institutions go and apply for these federal grants, they can apply under a number of world region categories. So they include like Africa, Middle East, um, Latin America. For this project, I'm focusing on the East Asia, Pan Asia category because that is one of the categories that my institution receives funding from. So on this slide, you can see all of the institutions that were awardees from this most recent funding cycle. Um, and the grants last for four years. So this most recent funding cycle started in 2022 and is going through 2025. So for this project, I decided to focus on a subset of these, um, of these institutions. And so you can see at the bottom in the box, um, the University of Utah and Brigham Young University are lumped together. That's because our institutions apply jointly for these grants. We're the only institutions that do that for this category. Um, so I was trying to find like, how do, I, how do I pick some of these institutions? I was trying to find peers of the University of Utah. Um, so I was looking at ARL data from 2022. I focused mostly on um, total material expenditures and total student FTE. And I kind of came up with this subgroup. Um, so I analyzed the narratives from the University of Arizona, 
University of Kansas, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and the University of Colorado Boulder, and then of course the University of Utah's and BYU's joint application. So that's five, propose, uh, five narratives from six institutions. One more thing you need to know about the data before I jump into the findings is that as institutions go and apply for these federal funds for their area study centers and programs, they have to, in their narrative, address a section, section F, called the strength of the library. It's a scored criteria section, so it's, it's very important that they score well. Um, and they're asked in the, in, in the instructions of these grants to address two questions. One, talk about the strength of your institution, and then the kind of financial support for materials and staffing, and two, how the institutions share these area studies collections amongst each other. And I also want to state that these grant narratives can span 80, 90 pages of double space text. Um, they're huge, and there's a ton of information in there. I only, for this project, focused on the strength of the library section. Those sections can span between three to five double space pages for the institutions I reviewed. Okay, so these are my findings, these are my themes. And I will say that um, I probably will go through and refine my themes again. Um, this is kind of where I am now. Um, for this methodology, they say you should come up with like two to six themes. I'm at the higher level, so I'll probably refine it. So that's a lot of what this qualitative method is, is going back and back and boiling it down until you kind of have some themes that represent your data. Um, so I'm gonna jump into each of these themes really quickly. I'm gonna explain the underlying of how the codes um, all fit together under a organized concept. And I'm gonna give a couple extracts uh, to kind of justify how I came up with these themes. Um, so the first theme I'm calling claims to legitimacy. It's the first thing that popped out as I was reading these narratives over and over again. Institutions um, are claiming um, the legitimacy of their area studies, their East Asia, Pan-Asia collections, compared to other institutions, and they kind of give themselves these geographical regions. Um, none of them are cited. <laughs> it's all just them claiming um, the importance of their collection, but it makes sense, right? They're seeking these grants. They want to talk about how important they are. So if you look at the first one, BYU says it has the best Asia library collection uh, between Mississippi River and California. If you look down to CU, which is University of Colorado Boulder, um, it, they say they curate the largest collection in the Mountain West and Southwest, so there's some overlap. Um, but each of them did this, um, so it was quite interesting. Um, the second theme is what I call interdisciplinary nature. So as I was reading these sections and um, in the paragraphs that talked about budget and staffing, I noticed that they um, they couldn't put themselves in a box when they were talking about their, their East Asia and um, Pan-Asia collections. So if you look at the first one, BYU, before this sentence, they start listing East Asia um, databases, specific ones, and then they say, additionally, we have 120 databases that fit into the humanities and social sciences and businesses with some Asia content. It's because these collections are just naturally interdisciplinary, and even if you look down at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, they specifically state that it's difficult to compute that staffing. So it just kind of attests to the um, interdisciplinary nature of them. The third theme is noteworthy collections. This one makes sense, right? Um, these institutions want to highlight specific collections, and these descriptions go beyond statistical counts. They, uh, they want to give a shout out to spe specific collections that are the gems of, of their libraries. Um, so if you look at University of Utah at the top, they talk about their Arabic and Persian books that are unique to the U of U. Um, down below, University of Arizona, they say, um, they call out their poetry center. Um, so these institutions not only talk about their library collections, they talk about other collections that their users have access to. And in the case of University of Arizona, their poetry center has a ton of East Asia um, anthologies on poetry, um, which is super cool. Um, Another theme is what I'm calling vernacular language holdings. So as I'm looking at these um, proposals, I, uh, institutions can format them however they want. They don't have to include visualizations like charts, but the ones that did all focused on the vernacular language holdings. So these are statistical counts. If you look at the first one, that's University of Colorado. You see they list their languages and then they list how many um, items they have by material type. 
U of U and BYU put their statistics together, and then University of Arizona, um, the top half are the languages, I, what I understand are physical materials, and then they lump all their e-resources together. What I think is interesting here is the breadth of languages addressed um, by these institutions, and you must keep in mind that University of Colorado and U of U and BYU um, submit under the Pan-Asia, so they, their coverage of their centers and the languages they support are, is a broader world region. Uh, University of Arizona is East Asia specifically. Um, but even all the collections go beyond Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, which I found very interesting. Um, and so wanted to call it those, uh, those graphs. Another one, um, second to last, I'm almost done, is age and growth. And I, I found this one super interesting. So it's institutions um, talking about how established their, uh, their uh, libraries are, their collections. So at the top, the University of Utah um, claims that their Middle East library is internationally recognized, right? So it's implied that there's been time for it to grow to have that type of reputation. Um, but what I love is uh, University of Colorado and Can University of Kansas state that their collections are relatively young, you know, made in 80, or established in 89 or the mid 90s. And if you look down at uh, Kansas at the bottom, they state that um, there's, their Korean collection grew because of these Title VI funds. They were able to establish a completely new collection because of these federal grants. Uh, last one, and this one makes sense because they were asked to address this in the instructions, was connected sharing, but I think it really gets to the heart of what area studies collections are and the uniqueness of them, that these collections aren't um, cookie cutter, right? We're, they're meant to be shared. Institutions are meant to collect these unique materials and then hopefully make them accessible to others so that we can work together to support these language programs on campus. Um, and so in conclusion, um, I don't think that my results are generalizable because I only um, uh, uh, did analysis of five of the 19 um, proposals of the current funding um, cycle. Of course, there are other older funding cycles, and of course, there are um, other world regions. There's just so much data out there to look at. Um, but I do think that you can, can, can kind of transfer them as long as you take that into context that this was a small subgroup or sample. Um, but I feel like you can um, take a few things that uh, be, area studies collections can't be just described in statistical counts, um, that the, the subjects and those specific collections matter, and that libraries should pay attention to these area studies collections. There's funding to be, you know, collaborated with from these grants, um, and that sharing is essential. Thank you. Amber, if you can stay with us. And, and the other presenters, if you'd like to come and huddle around, uh, please do. Uh, we have a... Uh, some time for some great questions. Let's give these presenters a great round of applause for some really dynamic, innovative products. If I, if I may take the privilege of asking uh, the first question, and I'd like for everyone to take 10 seconds to answer, what is the one message you would like for this audience to come away with from your presentation today? And let's start at, at the far end. <laughs> That'll teach me to sit at the end of the table. Um, that gifts can be a really beneficial thing to our libraries if managed well. Um, I think it's kind of very much following on from the sentiment of our first visit to Charleston, which was which was last year. That um, the actual the content that we produce is just one aspect of what we do as a university press. And, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the biggest, I think, I think the, the biggest priority that we feel as a, as a university press, that we are, we are a department of an institution, but we're also one component of this wider scholarly community. And so, so, so dialogue very much two-way is, is, is really the, the thing that we would like you guys to, to come away with. Okay. <laughs> I guess that area studies collections in your academic library are um, interdisciplinary and collaborative, so not even um, amongst disciplines, but even in the library, many of your librarians and staff are gonna be working to build these collections, and we should th think more about how to collaborate within the institution and with 
other institutions? I would say that representation in children's books matters, and both in terms of who is represented and how they are represented, and that the diverse book finder is poised to provide that resource for um, not only a collection that you can browse, but also a diversity audit that you can use on your own collections. And what about our colleagues back here? Please step up. You can step up here to the mic. <laughs> no. yeah. Rachel said it better than I would have, so that's, thanks Rachel. <laughs> And following on from Rachel, I think go and look at our Global Social Challenges Journal. I saw lots of sessions yesterday talking about open access and how important it is. And it's an open access journal that truly is um, really international and brings in Global South authors in a very authentic way. So if you want to share something that's going to be really valuable and take something back to share with your colleagues, because I know that's often what you have to go and do, go and have a look at it and share that. All right, we have a microphone to my left, your right, and my right and your left. What questions do we have for this great panel of innovative speakers? 